Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. I'm entitled this message, The Fellowship of Christ. The Fellowship of Christ. Verse 9 says, God is faithful. By whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, at the beginning of this book, the Apostle, we remember, first of all, established his authority in writing this book. He said that he was an apostle by the will of God, by the will of God. Apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And he establishes this letter. He writes this letter to a very specific group of people. He says in verse 2, "...unto the church of God which is at Corinth." The church of God. This letter is not for all men. It is for the church of God which is at Corinth. And notice he doesn't just limit it there. He says, "...and to all in every place that call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours." So this letter is to the church of God which is at Corinth of Shirley. But it is also to every church. Every church of God, which is every believer in Jesus Christ. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? I think this is how we should approach these books. Are these, is this for you? Are you a believer in Christ? Surely this is for you. This is written for you. I'm not saying, do you believe Jesus exists? That's not the question. I'm not asking, do you believe He lived and died on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago? I'm not asking, do you believe that he, that he rose from the dead in a literal sense? You see, to believe on Christ is not just to give a mental assent to the truths of facts. No one can refute Jesus existed. You know that? No one can refute He died. No one can refute the fact that He rose again from the dead. And you remember in Jesus' day, many people believed on Him that were not saved. That were not saved. In other words, they had a mental assent. They mentally assented to the truth that He was the Christ. One of those places in John 8, I'll read it to you. The Scripture says, and he, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You see, when they heard the gospel of their bondage, when they heard the gospel of their need of deliverance, it was that gospel that offended them. They believed on Him so long as the gospel He preached did not offend them. And that what happened the first time Jesus preached? He preached in that synagogue and they loved His words until He said, No, you're the sinner. And then they wanted to throw Him off the cliff. Men will believe this, the ascent to the historical facts of the gospel, but when the gospel is preached, it is then men rebel and hate the gospel. Christ's gospel is a message of sovereign mercy and free grace. Does this, does this offend anyone? It only offends those who do not believe on Jesus Christ. It offends those who only have a mental assent to the things of Christ. But to us who believe on Christ, this is not offensive. It is joyful to be set free. It is joyful to understand my bondage and need of Christ and to find in Christ all I need. And so all who believe on Jesus Christ, you are the church of God. And don't you know this? Paul said you are sanctified in Jesus Christ. You were sanctified by God the Father in election. Sanctified in Jesus Christ before the world began. 
sanctified when he died, sanctified in him when he lived a righteous life, sanctified in him when he rose again from the dead. You are his sanctified people and you were called by the Holy Spirit to life and faith. And so now then you, like the church of Corinth, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We confess that we are sinners and only saved by His grace. Now then, to you, this message is for you, concerning the fellowship of Jesus Christ. To these, Paul writes that in our text, God is faithful by whom you are called to the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now what does the apostle mean by fellowship of Jesus Christ? What is his intent and purpose toward the church of God in calling our minds to the fellowship of Jesus Christ? I have two points this morning concerning the meaning of that phrase, fellowship of Jesus Christ. My first point is this, the union with Christ. Every believer in Christ is in union with Christ, in fellowship with Christ by union with Him. And second of all, we are partakers. Partakers with Christ. That's what it means to be in fellowship with Him. First of all, let's see the union that is in Christ. I'm going to tell you to turn to several places. Go to uh, John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And look at verse 4. I want you to see, first of all, that Jesus Christ, that all believers know this, that Jesus Christ is the life. He is the life. In other words, all life springs from Him. He is the source and fountain of all life. That's what John tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the life, and especially this matter of spiritual life. He is the source and spring of life. Now, see then, our union with Jesus Christ is the only way anyone has spiritual life. No one has any spiritual life apart from their union with Jesus Christ. Look what Christ says in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in it of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. He said, abide in me and I in you. Jesus is stating here a spiritual truth. You who are believers, you abide in him. You are in him. And he is in you. This is a fact. This is a truth. Abiding in Christ. We are one with Christ. So that all who believe in him, he abides in them and they abide in him. And then he gives that illustration. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. Isn't that just simple? I love the way the Lord gives simple truths, simple things that no man can misunderstand. You take a branch and you cut it off from a vine, and you throw it over there to the side, and you watch it a couple of days, and it'll show you it's dead. It cannot exist. It cannot bear fruit. It cannot do anything by itself, except it abide in union with the vine. And so Jesus said, except you abide in me, except you have union with me, you cannot have life. For your life is divide, de derived from your union with me. And so then, all who are in Christ, if we are outside of Christ, outside of union, we could have no righteousness, no sanctification, redemption, faith, love, or any other grace outside of Him. 
Jesus tells us plainly then he is the vine. He said, I am the vine. This illustration I just gave you, I'm talking about me. And I'm talking about you. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Religion has it backwards. Men think they're the vine. And all they need to do is attach Christ to themselves, that He's a branch, that He can't exist without them. No. He's the vine. We're the branches. He is the root and source of spiritual life and spiritual fruit. And what does this mean, believer? It means we are absolutely, totally, completely dependent upon Him for everything. Everything. And you take that everything is as far as you want to. Just take it out there. And everything simply means everything. Especially the spiritual things. We derive everything from Him. So we who believe in Him, we confess. Without Him, I can do nothing. We confess that we believe that by His will and sovereign grace and power, we live solely by His will and grace. And if we continue to have spiritual life, it will be solely by His will and His grace. I go to Romans chapter 11. Paul uses this same analogy in Romans chapter 11. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Scriptures are very repetitive, aren't they? That's good for us. Maybe I pray the Lord will cause it to sink in. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 11. He said, If some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakers, partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. You remember many of those Jews who were only Jews by blood. He said those branches were cut off. Those branches were left outside of Christ. They had no union with Him. Uh, there are some plants that have these little sprouts on them that they don't grow anything. They don't have any nutrients going to them. They don't have anything. They're attached, but they don't have anything going to them. That's what these Jews were who was his, were his only by name and blood. He said, but you, you weren't in this tree at all. You had no union with this tree. You had no right to this tree. But God in grace grafted you wild olive trees into the root into the true olive tree and from him you now receive the fatness the nourishment the strength from the root which is Christ he is the root and we are partakers of this root he is the root the olive tree and the vine and all our union we are made partakers of the sap and fatness that is in Christ. So what right do you have to boast? What right does the church, believers, have to boast? Paul says in verse 18, Boast not against the branches. Don't you boast against them that were cut off. Don't you exalt yourself as though you had anything to do with this. But if thou boast... Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Don't you know that the root bears you? Don't you know that Christ carries you? That Christ sustains you? That Christ grafted you in? You didn't do this for yourself. Most not against them. Isn't this wonderful? We don't bear Christ. All false gods have to be carried, don't they? You remember he mentioned old Baal and Nebo. He said Baal and Nebo. Those, those gods were so several stories high. And they had to be carried around on carts. And these oxen would pull these carts. And pretty soon they'd be so heavy the ox would fall down. 
and they couldn't be borne by them. God says, look, you don't bear me, I bear you. You don't sustain me, I sustain you. This is what it is to have fellowship with Christ. It is to be sustained by Him. It is to receive all the blessings and fruits and benefits that are in Him. We receive it from Him. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and look at verse 20. Paul says this, For I am crucified with Christ. Don't you see the union there? He said, when Christ was crucified, so was I. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. Union. Union. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Herein is the fellowship and our union. We were so in union... That when he died, we died. Now literally, I wasn't there in the body. But I was there in my representative. I was there in my federal head. I was there in my high priest. I was in union because of God are you in Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Don't you see the blessedness of this union? that God put you in Christ long before you ever experienced it. You were in Christ when He died. Nevertheless, I live. We were made alive by the Spirit of God. And the life that we now live in the flesh. When God gave us that new nature, that new heart, you know that He did not eradicate the old nature, the old man, it still abides in all believers. And a constant struggle between that and the new nature is ever present among us. But this does not disrupt your union with Christ. Don't you know that? It has no effect on your union with Christ. The life I now live in the flesh. How do I live? I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now you notice he didn't say live by faith in the Son of God. He lives by the faith of the Son of God. Remember, it was the faith of the Son of God that provided righteousness, that made righteousness for us. Romans, 20, Romans 3 and verse 22. The righteousness of God which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. You know how I'm living? Because of His righteousness. By the faithfulness of Christ, I live. I live by this truth that He loved me and gave Himself for me. I'm so thankful it doesn't say... I live in the flesh by my faith and my love for Him. Does anyone want to take your love and measure it? Do you want to hold and stand on your faith in Him? How long will it last? It's nothing. Nothing. Oh, but I stand on His love for me. I stand on His offering for me. Don't you see now how the, the branch receives from the vine the fruit of righteousness? And all of this is constantly flowing to you. It's ever-present union with Him. Why do you live at all? Why do you have spiritual life? Why do you continue to believe? How often have you, have you even felt as though you have, have slipped and gone away? And yet you're still here. Why? Because you are being born by the, by the, vine. the vine. You don't bear the vine, the vine bears you. You are in union and fellowship with Christ is the reason you'll never go away. Shall you go away also? And immediately the word comes to our mouth, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we are sure that thou art the Christ, 
the Son of God. And so not only is this, but go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 12. This fellowship, this union is likened not only to a branch, not only to a, 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 a vine or an olive tree, but it's likened to the human body. Look at verse 12. For as the body is one. I'm so glad our bodies are one, aren't you? How often would you forget your arm or your head if you left, <laughs> got in a hurry, you'd forget something. It's one. Wherever you go, you don't leave it behind. It's one. And it hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit you are baptized into one body. Whether it be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, we have all made, are all made to drink into one Spirit. May God please let us see the blessed union that we have in Christ. This union that began before the world was, but is now manifest by our baptism into this body. What is our baptism into this body? It's not the water baptism. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the giving of a new heart, a new life, a new nature. And faith in Christ is the manifest evidence of that new nature. And no, so now we are manifestly one with Christ. All the church is one body, being many members. Would anybody say their finger is not a part of their body? Their toes, their eyes. No, it's all part of our body. And so the church of God is made up of many members, but all one body. The true church of God is everyone in every place that calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we may have different offices, different functions in the church, but yet one body. This is why believers love one another, isn't it? Does anyone hate any part of their body or wish to separate from any part of their body? We do not willingly want to. Because our body is precious to us. How much more precious then is the church to us? This is how when we are become one with Christ, the church becomes very precious to us. The body of believers, every believer. And so then we love one another. When one member of the church hurts, the other feels the hurt. The sorrow Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. This is what we do. I remember when I was, I was weed eating a while back. I don't do it much anymore. Andrew does it all now. So I was weed eating, and I remember just this rock. It hit this rock, and this rock started coming fast. It was coming. I, I, I don't think I even consciously knew it was coming till it was over. But all of a sudden, it was coming to my eye, and my whole body reacted. It was a natural instinct to protect my eye. And every part of my body did that. So it is with the church. When one of us suffer, the other suffers. Because we are one body and in union with Him. But where does this love and union come from? The head, isn't it? Christ the head unites the whole body together. I would have never known to defend my eye had not my head instructed every part of my body to move to defend it. So it is with Christ. Our union is so, so vital with Christ that our every movement is directed by Him. Guided by Him. Every providence, every circumstance is moved. Now, when I reach and grab something, my hand has no eyes. 
cannot see what it's doing. It doesn't know what it's doing except the head tell it. That's the same with us. We don't. How often do you know where you're going? What you're doing? How this is all going to work together? You don't need to. The head does. All we do is in obedience do what the head tells us. Why? We are in union. Do you not trust your head? My hand trusts my head. Implicitly. I tell you. I tell it to reach and grab something. It looks, it reaches, it grabs. It trusts the head. So do we trust Christ. Why? You are in union with Him. That's what it is to have fellowship with Christ. Now, my last part about this union is John 17. Look at this union. Then we'll go to being partakers. Look at this in John chapter 17. I want you to know how close. Now, head and the body is pretty close, isn't it? It's, it's very close. It's very intimate. But there is a greater picture of our union than just the body, the head, the vine, and the branches. And here it is in John chapter 17, verse 21. Our Lord Jesus Christ praying here says that they all may be one. Now, what do you mean? What does that entail? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us. How close is the union between the Father and the Son? It is an eternal union. It is an everlasting union. Listen to this. It's an inseparable union. As thou art in me, Father, I will that they be one in us. you would more readily separate the Father and the Son from their union and deity than you would one of His believers from Him. Now, what does this mean for you? That you are in union with Him. That you are in this vital union, inseparable union, immutable union with Christ. Is that not the most amazing thing? Now, listen, I'm not asking if you feel in union with Him. What is your feel? Have I read anything about how you feel? Believer, I'm reading about your feelings. No. I'm reading about something God has done. Not something you feel has done, but what God has done. This is it. This is what you are. You are in fellowship with Christ in a vital union with Him, an inseparable union from Him that nothing that happens in time or eternity can ever remove you from that union. Now, that's fellowship. That's fellowship with Christ. The second thing is this, the partakers with Christ. To be in fellowship Christ with Christ not only means that we are in union with Christ, but that we are partakers with Him. Partakers. What do we partake of being in union with Him? I told you that the sap flows from the, the, the vine to the branches and the fruit and all of that. What is that? What is this sap? What is this nourishment? What is this fruit that comes out? Well, first of all, I want you to see that you are a partaker of His nature. Go to Second Peter chapter 1. If you are in union with Christ, you are a partaker of His divine nature. Verse, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Now this is how it, it takes place. According to His divine power. That does away with all free will works religion, doesn't it? I'm going to have His divine nature according to what? According to His divine power. Not according to my will or works but His divine power, which was given us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When we were given spiritual life, you were given godliness through knowledge of Him. How did you come by this knowledge? Well, we know that it was through the preaching of the gospel that God, by the means of preaching, called you and gave you such godliness and knowledge by His divine power. And what is the sum of this work? The sum of this work is that you be made a partaker of the divine nature. The divine nature. Now, we know, as I've said before, that does not mean that we had the old man of sin eradicated by no means. The old man of sin is just as vile and corrupt as he ever was. Matter of fact, I discover new corruptions every day. The old man is still vitally with us. But by an act of sovereign grace, we are made partakers of the divine nature and have forever escaped the condemnation of God. Escaped. Through the divine nature, we have escaped the corruption. The corruption that is in the world through lust, we've escaped this. I like that scripture that says, There is therefore now no condemnation. I like that it doesn't say there is no condemnation. That's good. But I like the word now. Don't you? There is therefore now. And now. And now. And now. No condemnation. Now how can that be? Because I have a nature that is uncondemnable. I have a nature now that is holy as God Himself. This is what it is to be in fellowship with Christ. It is to be partakers of His very nature. It is that part that is created in us. That workmanship of God created in us by Christ Jesus. You see, God made that holy nature by the death and righteousness and resurrection of His Son. Other than me being in Him as a representative, I was nowhere to be found, but yet that's how God made it. And then in time, He gave it to me. You remember when Adam broke the law? When Adam broke the law, you were in Adam. You were in Adam. When he broke the law, all of us became unrighteous, ungodly. All of us. But listen, I was not yet a partaker of that until when? Until I was born. Now, I was unrighteous in Adam, but I did not yet partake of his unrighteousness until I was conceived. And at that moment of my birth, I was made a partaker of his nature. For by the disobedience of one were many made sinners. Even so, when I was born in this world, I was without the nature of God. I was without that divine nature. Even though Christ had already obtained that for me as my representative. Yet I was not a partaker until when? When were you made a partaker of this divine nature? when you were born again of the Spirit of God. It was only then we were made partakers of what was ours before. Now we are made partakers of it. Born again of the Spirit of God, this fellowship 
into which we are called testifies that we are partakers then of Christ's righteousness, of Christ's blood to cleanse us from our sins. We are partakers of His glory. And listen to this. Don't you know you are partakers of His throne? Whosoever overcometh, to him will I give to sit with me in my throne. So all that is Christ's, what it means to be in fellowship with Christ means this, that you are now a partaker of all that is Christ's. All he has. His nature, his righteousness, his blood offering, his resurrection, his glory, his throne is all yours. You are an heir and a joint heir with Christ. That's what it means to be in fellowship with Him. And lastly, we are partakers of His love and faith. His Spirit, which produces in us love and faith. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is what? None of his. We are made partakers of the Spirit of God. We have fellowship with Christ. John says here in his love, not that we love God. Isn't that right? We didn't love God, but that He loved us. And here's the manifestation. He sent His own Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we should love one another. No man has seen God at any time, for we, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And His love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us, what? His Spirit. And so what does this Spirit of God produce? It produces love. Love for God and the brethren. That's fellowship with Christ. Is to be partakers of His love. Don't you know God's love is very particular? Very peculiar? He loves all who are in His Son. And all who are in His Son love all who are in His Son. We do. Why? Because we are one. We are in fellowship with Christ. And we know this, that our fellowship is around this gospel, isn't it? When we fellowship... This is, the, this is the glue and ligaments that hold the church together is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what binds us. It's what we feed on. That sap. How, how are you going to receive any of this except by the gospel? Paul says, I, he says in uh, Philippians 1.5, he praises them for your fellowship in the gospel. We who are in Christ, we have fellowship with Christ. We have fellowship around this gospel of Jesus Christ. We love this gospel. We support this gospel. We believe this gospel. And we have cast off all the works of darkness. What are the works of darkness? That's not just your sin, is it? That's all false religion. False religion. That's the works of darkness that we cast off. We all had it. We all at one time served a God of our own making. We all at one time were religious and self-righteous. But God, rich in mercy, called us into fellowship. A vital union with His Son. We are called into this fellowship. And our union, our love is with Christ and with the brethren. Now look, at, look back in your text. Now, what should this do for the church? The understanding of your union with Christ and your uh, being partakers of everything that is in Christ, what should this cause us to do? Look at verse 10. Now, I beseech you, you who have fellowship with Christ, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak, all speak the same thing. What is that? The same gospel. 
we should be declaring the same gospel. If we have fellowship with him, we will declare the same gospel. We will. And that there be no divisions among you. I tell you, if we fully understand what it is to be in fellowship with Christ, there would be no pride. There would be no boasting. And friends, there would be no division. The only reason division rises in the church of Christ is pride, self-promotion, self-righteousness. And what is the opposite of all of those things? Listen, being in fellowship with Jesus Christ. That is the opposite. And that's the remedy for pride, isn't it? Paul is telling them the remedy for all their troubles in this church is the gospel. And what have I done? I preached to you the gospel. You who are the church, sanctified of God, you have fellowship with Christ. Union with Christ and partakers of all that is Christ's. Why? By grace. You are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Faith is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Pray God will bless this to you.